Welcome to your NCFE Level 2 Certificate in Principles of Business Administration, Session 2 of 4. In this session, we'll be covering Principles of Business Document Production and Information Management and Understand Communication in a Business Environment. My name is Phil Church and I shall be your guide and narrator for this session. This NCFE Level 2 Online Certificate in Principles of Business Administration has been brought to you by Poplar Harker and Solutius Equinox Training Solutions for Online Learning. The units covered today are Principles of Business Document Production and Information Management and Understand Communication in a Business Environment. So to remind you of what your journey for learning looks like. Well, we've completed session one of four and that covered principles of providing administrative services. And this is session two of four principles of document production and information management and understand communication in a business environment. Session three of four will be understand employer organisations, understand how to develop working relationships with colleagues. And then from there, if you require any additional tutor support sessions, they will be available. You'll complete your online assessment one through the ePortfolio. And that shall be marked. And then you'll have session four which understand how to store, retrieve and archive information principles of customer service, followed by online teaching support, which is available for all online sessions. And once that's completed, you'll go on to complete your online assessment two through the ePortfolio system. That is submitted to us for marking and you'll receive full tutor support throughout the program. And once that's complete, and it's all been signed off, you shall be able to receive your qualification. And a reminder for completing your assignments, it is important to understand the action verbs in the assignment questions. These are very important to ensure that you meet the assessed criteria for the questions being asked. The action verbs that you'll find within your Level 2 Certificate in Principles of Business Administration are those such as define. For define, you must give the precise meaning of a word with some detail. Describe. In order to describe something, you must give a detailed account of it. Explain. You need to ensure that your answer is clear, revealing relevant facts. And identify. Point out and explain. Your answer should establish who or what something is. Don't just give us a list of titles. Tell us a little bit about them as well. We will tutor you throughout the program and help you to complete the two assignments. Once you have submitted your assignments online, as I stated earlier, they will be assessed. All your completed assignments will then be submitted for internal and external quality assurance. And once this process is complete, you will be awarded your qualification. Now, as I stated, we have support for you throughout. And we have a remote assistance service and we can be contacted at learners at solutiusequinox.com. But this is important. Please mark your emails as NCFE Business Admin in the subject title, please. That way we don't lose your emails in amongst the sea of others and we can answer your question and inquiry as soon as possible. And you'll see the two telephone numbers for myself and Jason there who will be able to assist you. But don't forget, you also have your online learning support that follows these sessions in order for you to ask any relevant questions. In this section, we will look at understand how to prepare business documents. And to do that, we will 
describe different types of business documents that may be produced and the format to be followed for each. Explain the use of different types of information communication technology for document production. Explain the reasons for agreeing the use, content, layout, quality standards and deadlines for document production. Explain the importance of document version control and authorization. Explain the requirements of security, data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation may affect the production of business documents and describe organizational procedures for version control. Learning objectives listed in blue may be included in another learning outcome, such as here, as it relates to the subject matter in question. Different types of documents and their various formats. With email, you should always have an appropriate greeting for who you are sending your email to. Obviously, if you know the person and you know them really well, you can start off with hi and their name. But it's always appropriate to send an appropriate greeting to those people you don't know. Dear or good afternoon or good morning and their Mr or Miss or Miss or Ms. An appropriate sign off. Kind regards is usually used these days, certainly for emails, but don't forget, yours sincerely or yours faithfully is also still appropriate. If you know the person really well, again, some people use the initials KR for kind regards. It's dependent on who you are sending this to. This is really important that you get the most appropriate use of tone. Spacing. Don't lump all of your wording into one huge paragraph. Put your appropriate points into separate paragraphs and spaces so it can leap off the page and make it easier to read. Ensure you have the correct punctuation. Grammar is extremely important when it comes to writing documents and emails because you, your point can be lost. Sure, there's no spelling errors. Get it proofread if necessary or read it at least twice maybe before sending it. Modern systems such as Outlook and Word, they will underline the spelling. But make sure also that you check to make sure your dictionary is set the appropriate country that you are in. Because US dictionaries will underline something or change the word that may contain a Z like organisations. Or change it to a Z rather than, a, and then an S and colour. It will remove the U, so ensure that these things are checked and they're on the appropriate settings. Consider which greeting to use, because in some countries the use of the first name is deemed to be rude. But using formal language could be a barrier once a stakeholder relationship has been developed, because you're getting to know the person more, so you can relax those barriers. If you keep being formal in your email, it can come across as abrupt and rude. Using informal language could be deemed to be forward and inappropriate, so that once you've established the relationship with someone, find out how they want to be addressed and then use that. But what does the use of poor spelling or grammar say about you to the recipient? It may come across as unprofessional. You may lose your very valid point when you are trying to send an email or a document if it's full of spelling mistakes and incorrect grammar. They will look at it and they will be more concerned regarding the spelling mistakes than they would be with actually the content. So you may lose your point just on the spelling mistakes alone. For Word document reports, ensure it has a title and a title that's appropriate to what you're sending. And if you have authors that have helped you contribute or help contribute to this report, list them. Always ensure that there is a date on it for when it was written so they can show that they have the most current and valid and up-to-date version. If it is a considerably long document, make sure you break it down into component parts and have a list of table of contents. An executive summary of your findings, a conclusion, 
Some things may be inconclusive, but at least inform them as to your findings. Have an introduction, what you're intending to talk about within this report. And then you have your discussion and your conclusion. And any recommendations that you may draw from your findings. If you are using other people's work, ensure that you reference it. You can use particular styles uh, such as Harvard, if need be. And any appendices, if you have any documents or any tables or charts that you are sending with it, have it listed in the table of contents and send it as an appendix. Because reports should look and read professionally. They should be well structured and flow. You should always have a start, a middle and an end. They should not contain narratives which are chatty or unactual. So don't write as you would talk. Write professionally, methodically and ensure that you're writing it from a third person point, not from your perspective. Sources should be referenced, as I mentioned, where appropriate. And, and if it's an important document, have it proofread for accuracy, for grammar and for punctuation and to ensure that you are getting the right points across. For PowerPoint, such as presentations, again, ensure you have a title page so people walking into the room or people are opening up on their machines remotely can see at a glance what it is about. So also it gives them a, call, a kind of a welcoming page. Think back to when we started this presentation, it had an, a welcoming page page a title page that you knew that you were using and you were there for the right reasons have an aim what the presenter wants to achieve think back to the start of this powerpoint and we had an aim and the objectives and what we expected to do to when we get there which is an outline of the points that will be covered in each section have a summary to highlight the points that you've covered and it's placed at the end of the presentation. Have a conclusion if necessary. Make your presentations tailored and tailored design for the intended audience. Have them visually engaging. You may have heard of the term death by PowerPoint. That's when it's just word after word after word after word. Have pictures that come up onto the screen to, to, to emphasize your point. Good presentation skills are really important factors to keep audiences engaged. And hopefully you're not asleep during this one. But I can tell you, I, I, I'm, I'm terrible for going and to listen to PowerPoint presentations. And if they're not engaging, I start to fall asleep. Trust me, I bet you've done the same as well. They should be structured and concise. They should have a, 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 a manner around them that looks like you know that there is a start, a middle and an end. For agendas, if you're sending out agendas for meetings, ensure they have a title and who should attend, what time that meeting is, where the meeting is. Tell everybody that is attending what the meeting is going to be about. So you may have a short paragraph about what the meeting is going to achieve and what it has been set up to achieve. The main elements of the meeting and how long each one will take. Have a space for any questions and also include uh, an area for any other business. And any other business really should be declared at the start. So one part of your agenda, you should say, does anybody have any other business they wish to um, attach to the meeting? Yes, please. I have a I wish to talk about this. Thank you. And we can know that we can bring that up at the conclusion of a meeting and we start talking about any other business. Agendas should contain all relevant information and they should be easy to read and follow. Um, they should be up to date and agendas should be shared in good time in order for people to read through to know exactly what they're attending the meeting for. Minutes that follow the meeting should have a title and a date and time of the meeting. They should show the name of the attendees and the names of those who have not attended and any apologies given. 
show a reading of the agenda. And most minutes that I've ever dealt with have actually been in the same format as the agenda. To in, so the structure is achieved and it just basically has the actions underneath. Always have an approval of the mean minutes from the last meeting and usually the chair or vice chair or representative of those departments or people will sign the minutes from the last meeting to show that they were a true reflection of what occurred. Then you carry out your business and any actions from that business that's been associated with a particular person to implement. And the time the meeting was adjourned. Ensure minutes are accurate. Ensure that only applicable information is captured because the minutes should be shared with attendees in good time and should be in a format that everybody can read and ensure the notes are easy to understand after the meeting has ended because there's nothing worse than trying to go back through all of your minute notes and trying to interpret what everybody has said. For memos, who is the memo being sent from? And who is it being sent to? The date it was sent and the subject of the memo. A memo should be written so they can be easily understood at a later time and ensure that you've got all your useful information that's been captured. With letters, have a date and the recipient's address. Where is it going to? Have an appropriate greeting. Same goes for the email. Treat an email as an electronic letter. So the same rules apply. Have an appropriate sign off. As we discussed in the email, it's important to get it right. Sign it. Have an appropriate signature on there. And ensure that letters set the correct tone. Informal letters may come across as too familiar, where formal letters to people, especially who you know, may come across as too corporate, too cold, unfeeling. Consider sending your letters by registered mail or signature required to show evidence of them being sent and received because if they're lost in the post you can prove you've sent it and you may be entitled to compensation from the pot from the Royal Mail. Your assignment question is asking you for question 17 to describe different types of business documents that may be produced and the format to be followed for each. So again, think back of some of the ones we've covered for email, for reports, for the presentations, agendas and minutes and the things that you would expect them to be formatted and how they should be produced. And further reading can be found on pages 33 to 37 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Different types of information communication technology or ICT for producing documents. Word processing. Utilised for producing reports and documents. Desktop publishing. Utilised for producing brochures, posters, images and adverts. Spreadsheets. Utilised for producing financial documents which calculate values, macros bar charts and pie graphs and presentation utilized for producing presentations training packages for example email utilized for communicating with internal and external stakeholders and attachments could be sent with documents multimedia consists of TV, online media, video, YouTube, Twitter, etc. Your assignment question is asking you for question 18 to explain the use of different types of information communication technology or ICT for document production. So look back at some of the ones we've just covered in the previous slide for word processing, desktop publishing, spreadsheets, presentation, email and multimedia.
to assist you to explain the use of different types of information communication technology. And further reading can be found on pages 38 to 40 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Agreeing the use, content, layout, quality standards and deadlines for document production. The following needs to be known so you can create the correct type of document which includes the required information. If you have a deadline, ensure that you agree a realistic, achievable deadline because delays can be costly and disruptive to other colleagues. How will the document be used? How it's used determines what type of software to use, whether you be using uh, Microsoft Word, or Excel, or any other production document for brochures and so forth. If you are going to print it, what is the cost and the availability of the appropriate type of printer? If you are sending it via electronic, sure things like confidentiality, does it need to be protected with a password? And in some cases, the size of the document being sent may restrict it penetrating the firewall of the recipient. The quality. Will it be sent in black and white or colour? If it's to be printed, what will the paper quality be like? Consider the number of copies that are to be used and whether you be using multiple slides to a page to ensure that you can reduce the amount of paper. The content. To avoid confusion or creating the wrong thing gets as much information as possible. Does it need images? Consider the language you are going to use, whether it be formal, informal, business, and the tone. What are you trying to put across? The layout. Also, the layout will allow the correct software to be chosen because if you're using the wrong software, you'll make your life and job much more difficult. Whereas something as uh, Excel can calculate word um, macros for you and sums for you. Where if you're creating tables in documents, Word or another word processing program could do the same thing for you easier. Ensure all your elements will be in the correct place and it saves money on printing costs if your layout is in the correct place, which also reduces the number of pages. Question 19 will ask you to explain the reasons for agreeing the use, content, layout, quality standards and deadlines for document production. So for deadlines, agree a realistic, achievable deadline. Delays can be costly, disruptive to other colleagues. Think how the document will be used and that will determine the type of software that you'll be using, whether you'll be printing it and the availability of the printer and a cost. Whether it will be sent electronic, consider the size of the document and penetrate the security firewall. To avoid confusion, ensure your content is correct, get as much information across as possible. Does it need images to ensure that you're making the context as engaging as possible. Think of the language, the tone you are using and the layout. The layout will allow the correct software to be chosen. All the elements will be in the correct place. It saves money on printing costs. And think of the quality. What type of paper quality are you going to use? Will it be black or white and cut or colour? Think of the number of copies and will you have multiple slides to a page? The importance of document version control and authorization. It is vitally important when producing documents of any description that they are identifiable by their version allocation. The authorizer of the document should also be clear. This ensures that readers are viewing the most up-to-date version of a document and they can ascertain who authorized its release. This system is common throughout business, government, training and other organisations. Think back to our first slide. Can you see the version number? 
This is how we control the different versions of the lesson that you are currently viewing. This lesson version is version 1.0 and was produced in May 2020. Further information for version 1.0 and the production date was 11th of the 5th 2020 and it was authorised by Jason Hunt. This system enables version control to keep a track of the live version. To keep a track of when changes are made and by whom. And to control who can make changes. Only one version so time isn't spent working on the wrong one, which is time consuming and adds additional costs. The authorization the project leader should sign off on a document before it is finalized. And this shows that they accept the content and how it looks. And a sign off sheet can keep a track of who has signed off and when. The assignment question is asking you for question 20A to explain the importance of document control and authorization. And further reading can be found on pages 43 to 45 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Controlling the different versions of a document within an organization. Looking back at our first slide again, adding the word draft or final to the end of the file name. If you're using a Microsoft Word document, you can actually use a watermark that puts the word draft written right across the document to show everybody that what you are working on is currently a draft. Adding a version number to the end of the file name and putting the version number in the header or footer on the front page of a document. And making finalized documents read only versions on a control table. So whoever has the authorization to make alterations to it knows the password to it. Question 20B is asking you to describe organizational procedures for version control. So think back to the previous slides with our front page, adding the word draft or final to the end of the file name or on the document itself, having a watermark with the word draft written across on a Microsoft Word, for example, adding a version number to the end of the file name, putting the version number in the header or on the front page of the document and in the footer and making finalized documents read only that can only be opened with access by the project lead and having a version control table. Security, GDPR, copyright and intellectual property legislation and how this may affect the production of documents. For security, documents should be kept safely and securely, for example, personnel information, clients and personal details. Policies to prevent documents from being removed from the building. And considering data protection for general data protection regulations, information is handled according to the GDPR 2018. Company policies to ensure that you have drafts are kept secure and are not sent to the wrong person or people. Documents shouldn't contain any sensitive or identifying data, for example, addresses or date of birth. Copyright, a 1998 act protects original work and it ensures any content images that are used in documents is not copyrighted or if it is, that you have permission to use it. Intellectual property rights. It creates policies to ensure that intellectual property rights are protected 
if they belong to the company, are not infringed if they don't belong to the company. Question 21 is asking you to explain the requirements of the security, data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation that may affect the production of a business document. So think along lines of the security and how the documents should be kept safely and securely. Think about data protection, how your information is handled and how it's handled according to the GDPR. Think about copyright. Think about the images that you use within a document. Are they copyright protected? Are the information that you're gaining from images, is it being used as free for use for everyone? Think about the Copyright Act 1998 that protects original work and it ensures that any content or images that are used is not copyrighted. And think about intellectual property rights that creates policies to ensure that intellectual property rights are protected and are not being infringed if they don't belong to the company. Further reading can be found on pages 45 to 49 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at understand the distribution of business documents. And to do that, we will explain how the requirement of security, data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation may affect the distribution and storage of business documents and explain the requirements of data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation relating to document production. And describe security requirements relating to document production. And explain how to check the accuracy of business documents. And describe the different types of distribution channels. Security, GDPR, data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation and how this may affect the storage and distribution of business documents. Think about the information that is contained in documents as valuable property that either belongs to individuals or the organisation. It is therefore vitally important that information or data is kept safe and there are laws to ensure compliance in this respect, namely the GDPR. So always use locked filing cabinets if you have paper data. Use secure rooms. Have a document log to keep track of who has access accessed which document and when. Put passwords on all laptops and mobile phones. Encrypt USB content because if it gets lost, stolen, the information cannot be retrieved without the password. Restrict which files can be sent over email. Many companies have small firewalls restricted to 10, maybe 20 megabytes in order to ensure that they cannot have a hacking attack on their computer systems forced by large files. You may need to find an alternative method of sending a large file to a company if you have to do this. Store documents on a secure server or cloud that can only be accessed by password or unique code and only shared with the appropriate people. The GDPR sets out six main principles. These are that personal data is processed lawfully, fairly and in a transparent manner in relation to individuals. It's collected for specified, explicit and legitimate purposes and are not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with those purposes. Further processing for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes 
or statistical purposes shall not be considered to be incompatible with the initial purposes. Adequate, relevant and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. Accurate and where necessary kept up to date. Every reasonable step must be taken to ensure that personal data that are inaccurate having regard to the purposes for which they are processed are erased or rectified without delay. It has to be kept in a form which permits identification of data subjects for no longer that is necessary for the purposes for which the personal data are processed. Personal data may be stored for longer periods insofar as the personal data will be processed solely for archiving purposes in the public interest, scientific or historical research purposes or statistical purposes, subject to implementation of the appropriate technical and organisational measures required by the GDPR in order to safeguard the rights and freedoms of individuals. And that it's processed in a manner that ensures appropriate security of the personal data, including protection against unauthorised or unlawful processing and against accidental loss, destruction or damage using appropriate technical or organisational measures. So for 21b, your assignment question is asking you to explain how the requirements of security, data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation may affect the distribution of storage and storage of business documents. So consider the use of locked filing cabinets, the use of secure rooms, a document log to encrypt USB content restricting which files can be sent over email, storing documents on a secure server or cloud that can only be accessed by the appropriate people and is accessed by passcode or unique code. Think about the GDPR and what those six main principles are. Further reading can be found on pages 45 to 49 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Legislative considerations relating to document production. So consider the GDPR. The names, addresses and dates of birth, credit or debit card details, password and usernames, medical records, bank account details, and refer back to question 21b for full details of the principles, the six principles of the content of the GDPR. Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1998. Any work created belongs to the individual or company and no one can copy or reproduce it without permission. Anyone who does can be prosecuted in court and may have to pay a fine or receive a prison sentence. And if you look at the very last slide of this presentation, we have something very similar there to protect our work. Intellectual property rights. It allows creators to take legal action against anyone who steals or copies their property. And it includes copyrights, trademarks and patents. So for AC 4.4, question 4 is asking you to explain the requirements of data protection, copyright and intellectual property legislation relating to document production. So consider the GDPR surrounding names, addresses, credit and debit card numbers and details, passwords, usernames, medical records, bank account details. Referring back to 21b for full details of the principles of the content of GDPR. The Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1998 and what is the involvement with that. And the Intellectual Property Rights Act 2014 and what that allows creators to do regarding the copies of their property. 
Further reading can be found on pages 45 to 49 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Security requirements relating to document production. Thinking back to the General Data Protection Regulation, Copyright Designs and Patents Act 1998, and Intellectual Property Rights Act 2014. Ensuring compliance with GDPR requirements, storage of documents, keeping content safe, limiting access, for example, registering your designs under relevant legislation to protect your ownership, ensuring staff comply with all legislation, and putting training in place where required, protecting intellectual property rights of material being used. How to check the accuracy of business documents. Be factually accurate. Be grammatically accurate. For example, your sentences and paragraphs should be clear and easy to read and understand. Be error free. No spelling mistakes. Facts and figures should be correct and checked. Meet the business's documentation guidelines. For example, have an appropriate layout images, language and tone, as these are often linked to a brand. For question 23, it's asking you to describe security requirements relating to document production. And for question 24, it's asking you to explain how to check the accuracy of business documents. So remember back to question 23, General Data Protection Regulation, Copyright Designs and Patents Act, Intellectual Property Rights Act. Further information for those can be found on 45 to 49. For question 24, think about being factually correct and accurate. Be grammatically accurate. Sentences and paragraphs should be clear and easy to read and understand. Be error free. No spelling mistakes. Check your facts and figures. Make sure that they are correct. Meet the business's documentation guidelines. Have an appropriate layout. Images, languages and tone as these are often linked to a brand. This PowerPoint and the previous PowerPoints that we have are all brand specific and they are in the same layout to ensure compliance. And pages 50 to 54 of your handbook will help you answer this question. Different types of distribution channels. Email, an attachment, you can link to a folder, cloud such as Dropbox or a file sharing website. For post, for sending the letters or small parcels. A courier to send information and communicate with internal or external customers to send resources, to send products to clients or larger parcels. For internal, organisations may deliver letters and parcels to employees that originate from inside or outside the business. And don't forget there is document exchange or DX, which ensures speedy, secure courier travel of documents. Requirements for language, tone, image and presentation for different documents. As we discussed earlier on, Professional language, choosing the correct words. Using overly technical words can be confusing to those who are not subject experts, so avoid jargon. Style. In business documents, the language used is usually formal, which includes clear, meaningful sentences and avoiding using personal pronouns such as I. Your tone, formal or informal, will depend on organisation and message. The image, how the organisation wants to be seen. Documents should reflect and support the image. Presentation, for example, organisation guidelines and requirements, consistent and are on brand.
Question 25 is asking you to describe different types of distribution channels. So think back to the email and what is used to send with the email, what is used to send through post, courier, internal mail. And question 26 is asking you to explain the requirements for language, tone, image and presentation for different documents. So choosing the correct words, avoid using overly technical words that can be confusing, avoid jargon, consider your style, your tone, your image and how your image is seen by those receiving your information. And further reading can be found on pages 50 to 54 of your unit handbook to help you answer these questions. So in this section, we will look at understanding how information is managed in business organisations. And to do that, we will describe the types of information found in business organisations. Explain the need for safe storage and efficient retrieval of information. Describe the features of different types of system used for storage and retrieval of information. And describe the legal requirements for storing business information. What kind of information can be found in business organisations? Well, there are physical, and physical contains reports, presentations, memos, letters, financial and handbooks, whereas electronic consist of email, files, documents, reports, data. What kind of reports presentations, memos, letters, financial documents and handbooks might you come across? What kind of emails, files, documents, reports or data might you come across? Why would there be a need to safely store or retrieve information? Because safe storage stops sensitive information being stolen and used by criminals and sensitive information being lost. And safe storage stops legal action being taken against the organisation. And safe retrieval, secure storage facility locations should be known so they can be found quickly. Organisations should have constant access to these documents and if documents are stored electronically each one should be well labeled and easy to locate if there is password protection. The passwords should only be known to those who are granted access. A good filing retrieval system is one that is secure, safe, easy to use, fast to use financially economical, flexible and convenient. So question 27 is asking you to describe the types of information found in business organisations. And question 28 is asking you to explain the need for safe storage and efficient retrieval of information, to think back and research some more around some of those areas we have just covered concerning the physical and electronic types of information and how you go about with the safe storage, what it stops occurring and how is safe retrieval and what it does to occur and how a good filing retrieval system and what that is expected to be. Further reading can be found on pages 55 to 58 of your unit handbook to help you answer these questions. Think about the different features of the various systems used for storing and retrieving information, such as filing, 
binders, filing cabinets, trays and pigeonholes. They are easy to access. They're easy to alter, to remove documents. They can be destroyed by fire or rain. And they can be lost. And in some cases it can be time consuming to locate files, especially so question 29 is asking you to describe the features of different types of systems used for storage and retrieval of information. And question 30 is asking you to describe the legal requirements for storing business information. To think back for question th uh, 29, binders for filing, indexing, numerical information, alphabetical information and the applications that are required some file sharing systems think of their pros and their cons as well what's good about them what's bad about them for question 30 think about the GDPR regulation which protects personal information and if accurate records are not kept for tax purposes a penalty may have to be paid further reading can be found on pages 55 to 58 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. In this section, we will look at how to understand the essential requirements of business documents. And to do that, we will explain how to integrate images into documents and describe how corporate identity impacts upon document production. Using images in documents adds value and context Images can support and enhance content, so choose images that are relevant, relevant to what you are producing and what you're intending to show and what you're intending to present. Ensure that they are legal to use and won't infringe on copyright. Check on Google and Bing for images that are free to use. Choose the correct software for the correct job. Word processing software such as Microsoft Word spreadsheet software such as Excel, desktop publishing software such as Publisher, and image editing software. There are plenty available and there are some that are free to download and free to use and some offer free trial. It's all about being corporate when producing documents and the way that an organisation presents itself to the public through corporate design, corporate communication and corporate behaviour will ensure that you have an image that is portrayed professionally. You can see our branding logos and Poplar Harker's branding logos on our first presentation slide and on the banners below each slide and also within our email signatures. When producing corporate documents, your image impacts how documents should be created and distributed and stored so they are cohesive, relevant and in line with the corporate image. What, if any, colours should be used should be adhered to. The tone of language that should be used. And the type of information that should and should not be included. Your assignment question for question 31 is asking you to explain how to integrate images into documents. So think back to how they support or enhance your content, choose images that are relevant and legal to be used, and choose the correct software. And question 32 is asking you to describe how corporate identity impacts upon document production. So look at how documents should be created distributed and stored so that they are cohesive, relevant and in line with the corporate image. And what if any colours should be used, the tone of language that should be used and the type of information that should and should not be included and how an organisation presents itself to the public through corporate design, corporate communication and corporate behaviour and how that impacts. Further reading can be found on pages 59 to 61 of your unit handbook 
to help you answer these questions. In this section, we will understand the requirements of written and verbal business communication. And we will explain how different communication methods are used in the business environment and describe the communication requirements of different audiences. Think about the different communication methods that can be used in a business environment and their advantages and disadvantages. Communication methods such as face-to-face, -face, email, teleconferencing, video conferencing, telephone, letter. Think about their advantages and disadvantages. Their uses, face-to-face -face in meetings, conferences, trade shows, team building exercises. Think about the cons. Both parties need to be there physically. Venues need to be arranged. Abstractions from other duties. They're time consuming. They could be expensive. Think about their pros. You're able to ask questions and seek clarity there and then. You're able to read body language and gauge a reaction. You're able to network outside of the actual face-to-face -face meeting, for example. Email. It's fast. It's simple. It reaches an individual or multiple people instantly to provide information. You can use it to check on the progress of a project, to discuss questions or issues and to keep track of projects or conversations and for keeping records. But think about the cons. They can be impersonal. You're unable to get an instant response from a sender to a question if the user is not present. You may get an out of office reply. You may not get one and the person's gone home sick and you won't know. They can be seen as corporate and you're unable to re see the reaction of the reader or read body language of the sender. But think about the pros. They are corporate because everyone can get the same standard message and they can be sent at any time, anywhere around the world instantly and you have a record of their sending. Teleconferencing. It's cheap, there's no need for travel or accommodation, and it's a fast way of communicating, and decisions can be made quickly, and it brings national and international staff together at the same time. Think about the pros and cons for the others. What do you think the challenges are? Now SRAM, the model you see before you, the SRAM communication model, is a circular and the sender and recipient of the message can be the same person. A message is encrypted and is passed onto the, onto the person, the same person or to a different person, and it's up to the recipient to, de to decrypt that message to interpret it and then encode it again before sending the message to a new recipient. The source of the message is the sender, the party who sent the message. The source has to be clear when sending the message and has to be able to show why it is important that the recipient reads it. This is why the sender of a message has to make sure that the information he is providing is useful relevant and accurate and in order to ensure that the recipient can properly read the message it has to be encoded. This means it's necessary for the recipient to know the sender. The success of the attempt at communication will depend on the ability to bring across the information in a simple but clear way. The way in which the message is encoded is influenced by cultural aspects, perceptions, knowledge, attitudes, and experience. And the recipient decoder 
the recipient of a message is the person or group to whom the message has been sent. And whether the recipient is able to decode the message depends on a number of factors. For instance, how much does the individual know about the topic of the message? But also, how open are they for a message and do they trust the source? The interpretations of the recipient are influenced by cultural aspects, perceptions, knowledge, attitudes, experiences and skills as well. Decoding a message is a physiological process. After the message has been received, the stimulus is immediately sent to the brain for interpretation. This is where the message is given meaning, if at all. This processing phase is also called decoding. Communication is successful when the recipient correctly interprets the message from the source. And the message, in the studies of rhetoric and communication, a message is defined as information. This information is communicated through words or other characters and symbols. A message, either verbal or non-verbal, is in the content of the communication process and plays an important role in the SRAM communication model. A message contain, may contain verbal content such as speech, sign language, emails, WhatsApp messages, phone calls. A message may also consist of non-verbal content such as behaviour, gestures, body language, eye contact, physical contact, timing and even artefacts. Although it's not clearly indicated in the SRAM communication model, recipients play an important role throughout the communication process. They are not only supposed to just absorb the message, but they are also receive the message and respond to it. The reply from the recipient to the sender's message is called feedback. Feedback can be both verbal and non-verbal. Sometimes it's a verbal response, Sometimes it's just a sigh or a nod. Feedback is often expressed in writing, an email for instance. Video conferencing is an effective way of communicating. It's cheap, no need for travel accommodation, easy to share information, decisions can be made quickly, brings national and international staff together at the same time. Telephone is fast, Information could be provided in real time. Decisions can be made on the spot. People can be reached even if they are out of the office or on mobile phones. And letters, formal, personal, creates a formal record. When would all of these communication methods be used? Your assignment question is asking you for question 33 to explain why different communication methods are used in the business environment. To think back to different communication styles, methods such as face-to-face, -face, teleconferencing, telephone, letter, and their uses where you would use face-to-face, -face, email, teleconferencing, telephone and letters and so forth. And further reading can be found on pages 62 to 66 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Everyone as we know is unique and different. A method of communication preferred by one person may not be appropriate for another. So take a look at the why you may need to communicate to internal customers, such as your colleagues. You may communicate to them informally face to face through telephone, video conference, teleconferencing. Communicate them through them about the projects that you're working on and your current workload and everyday occurrences. Asking for or giving advice. Solving problems together. With managers and supervisors you can have a formal or informal relationship and communication method with them and a discussion regarding your workload. Any new and existing tasks. Discussions around your performance. Or any issues or problems and any questions you may have for them 
or they of you. And any new information that comes to light. And these can be done through email, face to face or telephone. Think about your external customers, such as individuals or companies. It's most probably on a more formal method of communication. Using face to face, letters, meetings, phones, emails, teleconferencing. So take a moment to think about the communication requirements and different audiences have. How would you approach them? Question 34 is asking you to describe the communication requirements of different audiences. Think about your internal customers, your colleagues and your managers and how you require communication from them and how you communicate to them. Think about your external customers, how you communicate to them and how they communicate to you. And further reading can be found on pages 66 to 69 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. When communicating, it is important to use correct grammar, sentence structure, punctuation, spelling and conventions to ensure that you have clear communication. And this removes misunderstandings in your communication. And it saves money and time because you're not having to resend or correct, make any alterations to and then have to send out the documents again. It matches the company's style and branding by having one format and one approach. It shows professionalism and it maintains the company's image. Question 35 is asking you to explain the importance of using correct grammar, sentence, structure, punctuation, spelling and conventions in a business communication. So don't forget, clear communication removes misunderstandings, saves money and time, matches the company's style, guide and branding, and it shows professionalism and it maintains the company's image. And further reading can be found on pages 69 to 72 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. Importance of using appropriate body language and tone of voice when verbally communicating. Your body language and tone of voice should convey a meaning and convey the tone of a conversation. The tone of a voice can provide clarity and as we all know and as we've all demonstrated in the past it can demonstrate mood. The tone of a voice, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. And it can engage audiences. It can also switch audiences off. If you come across as exciting and engaged, you're likely to build up an energy and then build up anticipation within your audience. And being engaging with a tone of voice can help understanding rather than monotone. And this subject relates to emotional intelligence. And although it's not covered here, you may wish to examine this topic yourself. Emotional intelligence with your clients, with your teams, with your stakeholders is extremely important. Making sure that we know how to communicate with them in the most effective manner that essentially doesn't create issues. Question 36 is asking you to explain the importance of using appropriate body language and tone of voice when communicating verbally. So don't forget, the body language and tone of voice can convey meaning, convey the tone of a conversation, while the tone of voice can provide clarity, demonstrate mood, engage audiences, build up anticipation and help understanding. Body language and tone of voice will convey meaning and convey the tone of meaning and can tone of a conversation, where the tone of voice can provide clarity, demonstrates mood, engages audiences and builds up anticipation. 
and further reading can be found on pages 72 to 75 of your unit handbook to help you answer this question. This concludes the second of the four sessions relating to your qualification. In your next presentation, we will be covering the following topics. Understand employer organisations. Understand how to develop working relationships with colleagues. And you will have been sent by email a time, date and go-to meeting link for you to log on for the teaching session which accompanies this presentation. And to get the most from your learning journey, please ensure you log on to this online session with your trainer. We hope you found this presentation useful and we encourage you to use the unit handbooks which are accessible in PDF format from your ePortfolio to support your studies. Any questions? As per usual, you can reach us on our remote assistance service where we can be contacted at learners at solutionsequinox.com and don't forget your emails must be marked with NCFE Business Admin to ensure that they don't get lost. And our contact telephone numbers are there for you as well. And you can also use our remote support service where you can contact us following this session. Thank you very much for your listening and engagement.